script to talk about embedding videos in your page. Because maybe for your project you want to embed a video. All right? Um, so there's a couple ways to embed a video. Let me download, let me download uh, the stuff that we were working on first. <laughs> yeah, the discussion is actually going to continue because I want to I wanna see uh, some Buster Keaton videos now. <laughs> so we changed the lecture at the last moment. Well, then, then there's always a classic joke. Someone asked me why I have a banana in my ear. <laughs> I can't hear you. I have a banana in my ear. <laughs> exactly. All right, so embedding videos. Nice thing is, if it's a YouTube video, they give you the code. So let's look for a Buster Keaton video. you want to put this on your page, <laughs> you can click embed and you get some code. And you can copy that. So we could go into this page then. And just paste that code in. And there you go. So to repeat that, Go to a YouTube video, click share, click embed, and you get some code. And you even have some options. And they show you some more stuff here. Um, so let's save that. It looks like I did save it. And refresh. And there you go. There's your video on the page. Yeah, very simple, very straightforward. I I wish I had a final exam in this class because I would <laughs> I would only ask questions about what happened in this video. So make sure you watch it. It's it's a lot of fun. There is actually an HTML5 video tag. And there's an HTML5 audio tag as well. And the HTML video tag works like this. It's an alternative way. 
video, and then you have a source, much like you have with uh, a, a J, a, 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 an image. Um, and you actually give, you can actually give multiple sources. And why do you think you would give multiple sources for a video? Well, in case a link breaks, that would be one possibility. Yeah, in, or in case a browser can't play one form of video or another. You know, sometimes between Mac and PC, there could be, you know, one format is good for Mac, one format is good for PC, or if you're on Linux or whatever. So you can give multiple, uh, multiple versions. But, yeah, and you could put this, and then you can run it. And you have the little video. Audio is virtually the same thing, except instead of video, it says audio. So, we look at HTML audio. Audio, controls, and again, we have two different formats with the source. And your browser um, will, will pick uh, the one that it can play. It starts going from the top down. Um, if I'm not mistaken. So in other words, if your browser could play an OGG uh, format, it would, it would, that would be the first option. And then if it can't play that, it will try the, the MP3. If it can't play any of them, then you get the message your browser doesn't support the audio element. If I'm not mistaken, something along that. Or, yeah, something along those lines. Or if your browser doesn't support HTML5 audio, you'll see that text, I think, is actually how it goes. So just on the chance that you would want to incorporate uh, video or audio uh, into, uh, into uh, your project. Uh, really, again, there was a banana in the front of the class, and that led me to talk about tripping on banana peels and falling and all the comic possibilities of that. So I wanted to show a Buster Keaton video, and we went downhill from there. All right, get, <laughs> getting back on track. All right, we left off last time talking about menus. And um, I don't think I had enough time to give them justice, so I'm going to come back and um, review them a little bit. And I'm actually going to start with two, and then we'll do one. All right, this is where we have menus that are, again, this functionality, it's, it's uh, scaled down a lot. Um, but this functionality is basically the functionality you have on the ESPN page. Only difference being that I didn't make these links. It would be very easy to make these links. In fact, let's go and do it, just to, even if I just make dummy links. I'll just do the first one and trust that the rest of them would work the same way. So there's no trick in these being links. You just put a link tag in the LI instead of plain text. Probably when I did this example, I was a little bit rushed, and I didn't go through and create links. But yeah, no, no real trick to it. By the way, in my examples, if I want to put a link but I don't actually have a page to link to, I just use the pound sign um, as the link. That, that's just a way to create a link that doesn't really go anywhere. Because pound sign, of course, we know simply means the top of the page. So if we go and look at that, now those are links. And as we put our mouse over them, they appear. As we take our mouse off, they disappear. Appear, disappear. Now, these I didn't fix, and we'll see why I didn't fix them, or, or, or we'll see what we could do to fix them, rather. So the last two are not really right. The first two are right. The last two are sort of half-baked. So let's look at this example in more detail. All right. Um, first of all, my navigation is a set of uh, unordered lists. Again, there's a few things that um, sort of belong in unordered lists. Navigation belongs in an unordered list. 
forms typically belong in an unordered list. Um, and in this case, we actually have what um, we actually have a set of unordered lists. The first unordered list is sort of the top level. In other words, the first unordered list is this list that we see on the top of the page. So these guys. I don't want to put my mouse on it because I don't want the other ones to appear, but these guys on the top. That's the top level unordered list. I then have a separate unordered list for the different submenus. And this drives me crazy that they're not indented correctly. So I'm going to take a second to fix that. You know, this isn't because I'm, uh, you know, a, a neat freak or anything like that. It's because really the way that you indent really um, uh, helps you read and understand the code. So take the time to indent. Um, sometimes when I'm grading assignments, I see people, and their code works, but it's very sloppily indented. And I mean, that's OK. It works. Good for getting the job done. But keep in mind that one of the things that you do when you create a page is you want to try to help yourself out later on when you go to change that page. All right. So whatever you can do to make the page more readable is going to help you in the long run. So indent neatly so that you can see that this unordered list starts here and ends here. Even without looking at the code, I can see that, right? Whereas the way it was before, I had to stop and think about it, all right? It's not that I can't understand it if it's not indented. It's that it's easier to understand if it is indented. At any rate, each of the submenus is its own unordered list. Notice what I did with classes. I have a class for level 1 on the top level menu. I have a class for level 2 that exists on all of the level 2 menus. So each of the submenus has a class of level 2. I give them all a class because I want to treat them the same way. That's what it means to say you have a class of things. A class of things means that you're going to treat them the same way, especially with regards to CSS. All right? So all of these have a class of level 2 because I want to treat all level 2 things the same way. How am I treating all level 2 things? Well, initially, I'm setting them out to be invisible. No display and a top margin of 0 pixels. And I'm making the LIs have a display of block. All right. I need to do that because in the initial CSS, I say all LIs on this page I want to set as being a display of inline block. So I want to overrule that for my level 2 LIs. I'm making those block, which simply means they're stacked vertically. Now. I then have an ID for each of these. Why do I have an ID? And again, that's the one thing that, that seems to confuse people is like the purpose of IDs. You use an ID in HTML the same reason that you use identification numbers in anything, to be able to uniquely identify one thing amongst other things. You have a student number so that we can identify you as compared to any other student that goes here. All right. So we know who to send the bill to. So we know who gets credit for the class. So we know who graduates, and so on. Yes. No, it goes the other order. The more specific it is, overrules the more general. So in other words, and a, a good way to think of it is 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 physical proximity. So if I put let's say, a, 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 if I put a style row on the body, let's say I say body, font, family, I can't type today, font, family, um, Arial, Helvetica, 
sans serif and I put a style rule for the ID of submenu. All right. The ID of submenu is closer to this stuff than the body tag is, right? So the more specific it is, the more specific it identifies, it takes precedence. So if I were to say pound side submenu one, um, font family comic sans. weird like this. I'm not sure if it's Comic Sans or Comic-Sans. Comic um, let's try the with the dash. Uh, that might not be a font that the browser recognizes, but um, Georgia. All right. Notice that the, the Georgia took precedence because it's closer to it. It's more specific. So it's actually the other way around. And that's sort of the cascading part. If I don't define a style rule for the ID, then the style rule for the body sort of cascades over everything that's contained in the body. But if I define something specifically for an element on the page, that takes precedence over something that I define on the body. All right? So, um, that's why here, I've defined all my LIs to be display inline block, but I've defined these LIs within a class of display to have a display block. That's why these are horizontal and these are vertical. All right. Now, um, so that's the CSS part of it. Um, the JavaScript part of it is I have on each of the main links, I have an on mouse over and an on mouse out. And I call a function. And a function is simply an easy way to take a group of ins an instruction or a group of instructions and give it one name. So you don't have to give like all the instructions right here. Instead of saying all the different things that I'm going to do, I simply say, hey, do this thing. My function then is defined in a script tag in the head section. Now, a script tag, you can think of a script tag as being like a style tag, right? A style tag says the stuff between the start and end style tag is not HTML. It's CSS code. Well, the script tag tells us that the stuff between the start and the end script tag is not HTML. It's JavaScript. So simply a way of marking out sections of the page that, that are of different languages. So here. We have a function. I give it a name. I describe arguments I give to the function. Again, what is an argument? An argument is something that may change every time I call the function. All right. The example I gave last time is you could have a square root function in Excel. Now, you give that square root function an argument. Because I can't say, calculate the square root, and you give me the answer, right? Go ahead, calculate the square root. Of what? Right, you have to know what you're calculating the square root of. All right? So, I have, if I, on the other hand, if I said, calculate the square root of 9, you'd say 3. Calculate the square root of 16, you'd say 4, and so on. Same thing here. I can say, I want to show this thing on the page. I want to hide this. Th I want to hide. Go ahead and show that, you know, go ahead and show an element. Which element? I have to supply which element. So which element am I going to show? 
the element whose ID I give to this function. Which element am I going to hide? The element whose ID I give to this function. So if I put my mouse over computer information systems, that corresponds to the first submenu. I say show, show submenu, submenu 1. Now notice that this is the name of the, uh, this is the ID of the thing that I want to show. I want to show this submenu. It has an ID of submenu 1. So I go in and I say show that submenu, show a submenu. Which submenu? Submenu 1. Notice that submenu 1 is in quotes because it's the ID of something. A specific ID gets put in quotes. So when this function gets called then, the value submenu1 gets placed in this variable or argument called argid. So in the function, wherever you see argid, in this case, is referring to submenu1. So we simply plug submenu1 in for argid. So now this instruction says, get element by ID, find a thing that has the ID of argid. Well, what's argid? When we mouse over the first thing, it's submenu1, and make the display of it equal to block. All right? The height is just the same. We give the argument, except we say, make it invisible. Set the style display none. Now, notice the second one. The second one, we call the same function, right? Because we're doing the same thing. We're not going to have a different function for calculating the square root of 3, uh, or, well, that would be hard, but the, the calculate the square root of 4 and a different function to calculate the square root of 9 and a different function to calculate the square root of 16, right? We're going to have in Excel, there's one square root function. And we simply tell the square root function what number we want the square root of. So here, I don't have a different function to show each submenu. I have the same function. I simply call that function and each time through, give it a different submenu to show or hide. So if I added 10 different items going across the top of the page, that wouldn't matter. I would simply copy this code and just call it with a different ID. Submenu 5, submenu 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever. All right? And the hide is the same. Now, if we only add that code, all right, then let me show you what happened. Let me cut this code out. Because I have to also put the same mouse over code over the submenu, right? Let's just show what happens if I don't do that. If I don't have the same code on the submenu, watch what happens. Oh, the submenu appears. I think I shall go and click on one of the links. It disappears. Well, let's get it back. Uh, joke's on you. You can't, all right? Now, that would be great fun to do, right, if you could watch the users <laughs> frustrate themselves trying to click on it. But it probably wouldn't be very good business. So therefore, I have the exact same code on the submenu. So in other words, As the mouse moves from here to here, this guy tries to turn it off, but this one turns it back on instantly. So it's still there so that they can click on it. Now here's an interesting thing. Watch this. One thing that you might not have noticed, I said there's a margin on the top of zero pixels. What if we made that margin 10 pixels? All right. Think for a second what might happen here. If I made a margin of 10 pixels, there's a space, there's a gap between there. So as I move my mouse, it's in that no man's land, and so it disappears, and it disappears before I have the chance to turn it back on. So all these things need to be right for this to work. I need a margin of zero pixels here, because I need
the menu, the main menu, I, I, need, I need an extra thing to point with. I need the main menu and the submenu to be right smash next up to each other, right? Because there can't be a gap. Because if there's a gap, when the mouse gets in that gap, it's going to disappear and won't be there to stay back up. So all these things work together to, um, to, to, to make it um, work as a unit. So the exact same thing happens for every other menu. Notice for this one, I have a left margin of 255 to push it over that way. So I put my mouse over that, this turns under, this shows up underneath. Actually, I'm having a little problem with that. But to do the other ones, I would need to push it over 255 as well. Or not, not 255, um, whatever the amount would be to push the, the, the social sciences one over. All right, the big idea here, the big difference between uh, this and the first couple of examples we looked at is the use of a function. And we use a, a function to make our code reusable, to make it easier to change, all right? So instead of having code specifically to show submenu 1 and code specific to show submenu 2 and code specific to show submenu 3, we have a function that could show any submenu we give it. And then when we call the function, we give it the specific submenu that we want to show this time. And same thing with the hide function. All right. We do something a little bit different in this one. Sort of the same idea, but different. This one, if you remember, you click on this, and you see the submenus that are underneath it. These are simply different navigations. Which one is right? It depends on the problem you're working at. You would think about, you would think about your users and think which navigation would work better for them. All right? Now, in this case, if we look at the code, and again, I don't have these actually as, as links, but it would be easy enough to make them as links. I still have unordered lists, but these are nested. What do I mean by nested? This unordered list is part of this list item. All right? Remember, you can put other, you know, <coughs> so far we've been putting links and text and lists, but you can put pretty much any HTML, including another list. All right? So in this case, this first list item consists of the word computer information system and a second list. And it's defined as submenu 1. It has a class of level 2. This one has a class of level 2. This one has a class of level 2. Our CSS, level 2, we make display none. All right? Now, we have a little bit different JavaScript code because, number one, we don't want the action that triggers things to be the mouse over. We want to have people click on the thing to make it work. All right? So instead of an on mouse over, we have an on click. All right? On click, handle submenu one. Secondly, I don't have a, I can't have an unclick, right? It's not like the mouse over where we have on mouse over, on mouse out. I can't have an on click and on unclick or on click again. So I'm handling everything with the on click event. So every time I click on it, something happens. But if you notice, the specific thing that happens depends on whether that menu is showing or not. The menu's not showing, it shows it. 
if the menu is showing, it hides it. So in both cases, I'm calling the same function, but that function's smart enough to know whether that sublist is showing or not. If the sublist is showing, it hides it. If it's not showing, it shows it. All right? The other thing cute I do is I change the little plus sign to a dash. The plus sign is, is pretty standard uh, on the web and in operating systems and so on. When you see a plus next to something, it generally means click on it and you get more. All right, that, that's pretty much um, a convention that's used. So people should understand that clicking on that would mean that I can see more things. Now, I don't need anything under the UL anymore because I'm not doing it based on the mouse in and mouse out. I'm doing it based on clicking on the main menu. So when I click on the main menu, I call a function and I say handle submenu. Notice I don't say show or hide because I'm not always showing it and I'm not always hiding it. I'm doing what's appropriate. If it's hidden, I'm showing it. If it's being showed, I hide it, being sh shown. So my function is a little more complicated, right? I still have a function. I still accept an argument. And that argument is going to get filled in with the name of the submenu that I want to do something with. So the first time I call it and I give it submenu 1. Down here I give it submenu 2, submenu 3, and so on. So what does this do? This has an if statement. Now, some of you probably have done some C, C sharp or maybe in the old days Visual Basic or whatever. An if statement allows you to do different things depending on whether something's true or false. All right? You use these all over the place in programming. If someone works more than 40 hours, they get overtime. Otherwise, they get just regular pay. All right. If someone is an in-county student, they get charged this much, much for tuition. If they're an out-of-county student, they get charged that much for tuition, and so on. Uh, so there's if statements all over the place in programming. Here, look what our if statement says. And how does an if statement work? Starts with the word if. I then have, in parentheses, a comparison some sort of comparison. In this case, look what I'm doing. I'm asking if the style, if the display attribute of whatever argument I've given to it, so whatever submenu I've passed to this, I'm asking if the display is equal to block. So, in other words, in human terms, is the submenu showing? All right. The sort of computer version of that is saying, is the display property set to block? So if the display property is set to block, then the if statement's true. And I will do these statements. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. All right. Because what I'm doing is I'm changing these submenus. Initially, these submenus have a display of none. But when I click on it, I'm setting the display to block. So I'm switching back and forth between a display of none and a display of block. All right? And I'm doing that depending on what it already is. Whatever it is, I'm making it the opposite. So if it's already showed, shown, I have to, I, yeah, I, don't, I guess it doesn't matter. If it's already visible, I will avoid using visible because that's a different property. Uh, if it's already able to be seen, I set the display property to none. That means that you don't see it anymore. And we'll ignore this statement for right now. All right? If it's not block, that means that it's not being seen. That means that it is none, I set it to block. So if the, if the display right now is block, I set it to none. If the display is not block, I set it to block. Yes? 
Okay, good question. Why do I have the double equals? I have the double equals because I'm comparing two things. All right? In a lot of programming languages, C sharp is the same way. If you have two equals, you're doing a comparison between two things. So this says make this equal to that. That's the single equal sign. It says make this, whatever's on the left side, equal to whatever's on the right side. So when you have one equal, that's called an assignment statement. Take the value on the right and make the thing on the left equal to that. So in this case, in the line that I've highlighted, make the display equal, make the display property of that submenu equal to none. All right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the style of this is just like C sharp, so the condition could be very, very complicated. In this case, it doesn't need to be complicated, but it could be, all right? So I'm looking to see, I'm doing a comparison to see if right now the display property of the submenu in question is equal to block. Does it equal to block? If it, and, and equal to block means that you can see it. If it's equal to block, then I'm going to change it to none, which means that you can't see it. If it's not equal to block, that means that you can't see it. So I'm going to set it equal to block, which means that you can see it. So this effectively toggles it. If it's on, it turns it off. If it's off, it turns it on. All right. Now, this instruction that I told you to ignore a second ago is simply changing this little thing on the page between a dash and a plus sign. Because remember, a plus sign means that there's more that you can see if you can click on it. A minus sign means that if you want to, you can hide it, right? That you can compress it or contract it. So if I make it invisible, I want to show a plus sign next to the word to say, hey, if you click on this, it will expand. If it's visible, I want to change it to a minus sign to say, hey, if you click on it, it'll contract. So how do I do that? Well, I have the instruction document, get element by ID. I take the ID and I add the word marker to it. All right, let's think that through. Here I'm calling submenu1. Submenu1, of course, relates to this submenu, the thing that has an ID of submenu1. But notice what this little plus sign, what its ID is. It's the menu name, menu ID, submenu1, plus the word marker after it. All right? All of these follow the same rule. So, the, if the ID is submenu, the ID for the little indicator is submenu 2 marker. If it's submenu 3, the marker is called submenu 3 marker. So whatever ID I want to show or hide, its marker is the name of the ID plus the word marker. So find a thing that has an ID that consists of the ID that I said I wanted to show or hide, plus the word marker on the end. This is known as concatenation. You know, you can't add strings together like you add numbers together. You know, with numbers, if I say 2 plus 2, I get 4, right? With strings, with letters, if I say, submenu 1 plus marker, I get submenu 1 marker. 
So that's called concatenation. Anytime you add things together that are characters or strings, that's typically what you're going to get. And that's definitely what you get in JavaScript. So I give the ID of the thing I want to show or hide. I know that the marker's name is whatever ID I have plus the word marker. What am I going to do to it? I'm going to change the inner HTML. What's the inner HTML? Well, it's the thing between the start and end tag. So that plus sign is the inner HTML of that span. Right? It's the code between the start and end tag. All right. So what this says is, find the thing on the page that has the ID that I want to show plus marker after it. And if I am hiding it, I want to change that inner HTML from whatever it is now to a plus. And I want to do the exact opposite here. I'm going to change it to a minus. Now there's something that you can do in JavaScript that you can do in most programming languages. Uh, and that is you can write comments. All right? uh, and comments are good to explain what the code does. All right? So that's useful when you go back and, and uh, um, you know, um, go back and, and try to make changes to it. Because again, it might not always be obvious to you um, why you wrote a particular piece of code. You know, it, it's like, me sometimes when I look at my notebook and I'll see like 5 plus 8 equals 13. Like two weeks later, I'll look and I'll see 5 plus 8 equals 13. What am I doing? Am I adding up how much money I owe someone? Am I figuring out what day I need to do this because I need to do this 13 days after the fifth? Or, you know, what does 5 plus 8 equals 13 mean, right? Well, if I had a little note that said, well, this is how much money you borrowed from your brother. You owed him five and you borrowed 13 more. You know, OK, that, you know, so a little note. So think of these comments as like little notes that tell you what this code means. Because otherwise, you're going to come back to this code and not be sure. Comments in JavaScript are simply two slashes. So I can say exactly the same thing. This function will take an ID and hide it if it is shown and show it if it is hidden. It also changes the marker to indicate if it's expandable or contractible. So a little explanation of what the code does. And they'll do so much. Again, Someone like, let's say you do such a great job in your web development uh, position that you get promoted to uh, project leader. And you no longer have to, to, to make the changes to this page. Well, the new hire that comes in is responsible for editing your work and changing your work and updating it. Well, if you give comments like this, that makes it much easier for them to go in and change it. But you know what? Even if you're later on going back and making the changes yourself, even if it isn't another person, a lot of times, you know, once you've finished a project and moved on to something else, if you go back and look at your old, old code, you may not remember why you did something a certain way or what it's supposed to be doing. So the comments can really make it easier. And if you understand the code and why you did it, it's going to make it easier to change it. So I can put comments here that says, See if the submenu is shown. This is the true part. If it is shown, hide it. Show 
change the marker to show it is expandable. If it is hidden, show it if, oh, and then I'm going to change the marker to show it can be contracted. All right. So there I have a nice function with comments in it. If I come back and look at this Monday, all right, I'll remember what it did, all right? And then I have a, a better chance of being able to quickly change it than if I just have the code by itself. All right, next week is our last week of classes, all right? Monday will definitely have more fun with JavaScript. Um, Wednesday, I am probably planning on having a work day, a chance for you to just wrap your stuff up, and more importantly, a chance for you to show other people in the class what you've done with the project and allow them to give you some feedback. Like, gee, that color combination is hard for me to read. Or, boy, that font is small. Maybe you could make it a little bigger. Or anything like that. Just, you know, I'm not really sure what that link means. All right? Maybe you could change the wording of that. Anything like that, you know, to give feedback. And just, just a fun way to share what you've done with the other members of the class. Um, it's a lot of fun, believe it or not, grading the final projects. Because people usually do stuff that they're interested in. Um, people come up with some really cool, clever designs. Um, that's the one assignment that is really a lot of fun to grade. So um, you have a chance to show, uh, you know, to do a little bit of show and tell with the other members of the class. All right. So we'll see you up in lab.